are still seats, you know. Yeah, yeah, my at least five per bench, so you should feel free to get comfortable. <laughs> Maybe I'll just go sit there. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out here. And thanks to Bruce and Sue for making this happen. I'm delighted to be with you. I've actually never been in Maine before. So I've had quite a lovely tour between Portland and Orono and driving down here today on those gorgeous roads, even in the rain. So very nice to be here. I thought that what I would do is uh, start with a brief reading from the opening of the book to give you a sense of the arc of the story. And then I would frame out some of the more contemporary significance of the cause that I write about and what it might mean for for all of us today. So let me start with a brief reading. As 1956 drew to a close, Colgate Whitehead Darden Jr., the president of the University of Virginia, feared for the future of his beloved state. The previous year, the US Supreme Court had issued its second Brown versus Board of Education ruling, calling for the dismantling of segregation in public schools with all deliberate speed. In Virginia, outraged state officials responded with legislation to force the closure of any local school that planned to comply. A practice, by the way, that we now know as preemption, which is spreading. Uh, Dar uh, some extremists called for ending public education entirely. Darden, who earlier in his career had been the governor, could barely stand to contemplate the damage such a rash move would inflict. Even the name of this plan, Massive Resistance, made his gentlemanly Virginia sound like Mississippi. On his desk was a proposal written by the man he had recently appointed chair of the economics department at UVA. 37-year-old James McGill Buchanan liked to call himself a Tennessee country boy, but Darden knew better. No less a figure than Milton Friedman had extolled Darden's potential. As Darden reviewed the document, he might have wondered if the newly hired economist had read his mind. For without mentioning the crisis at hand, Buchanan's proposal put in writing what Darden was thinking. Virginia needed to find a better way to deal with the incursion on states' rights represented by Brown versus Board of Education. To most Americans living in the North, Brown was a ruling to end segregated schools. Nothing more, nothing less. And Virginia's response was about race. But to men like uh, Darden and Buchanan, two well-educated sons of the South who were deeply committed to its model of political economy, Brown voted a sea change on much more. At a minimum, federal courts could no longer be counted on to defer reflexively to states' rights arguments. It was not difficult for either Darden or Buchanan to imagine how such a court might now rule if presented with evidence of the state of Virginia's archaic labor relations, its measures to suppress voting, or its efforts to buttress the power of reactionary rural whites by underrepresenting the moderate voters of the cities and suburbs of Northern Virginia. Federal meddling, in their view, could rise to levels once unimaginable. James Buchanan was not a member of the Virginia elite, nor is there any explicit evidence to suggest that for a conservative white Southerner of his day, he was uniquely racist or insensitive to the concept of equal treatment. And yet somehow all he saw in the Brown decision was coercive, but coercion. Find the resources, he proposed to Darden, for me to create a new center on the campus of the University of Virginia. And I will use this center to create a new school of political economy and social philosophy. It would be an academic center, rigorously so, but one with a quiet political agenda to defeat what he called the perverted form of liberalism that sought to destroy their way of life, a social order, as Buchanan described it, built on individual liberty, a term with its own coded meaning that Dar Darden understood. The center Buchanan promised would train a line, of, a, new lo a line of new thinkers in how to argue against those seeking to impose what he called an increasing role of government in economic and social life. He could win this war and he would do it with ideas. Some may argue that while Darden fulfilled his part, he found the money to establish this center, he never got much in return. Buchanan's team had no discernible success in decreasing the federal government's pressure on the South all the way through the 1960s and 1970s. But take a longer view. Follow the story forward to the second decade of the 21st century, 
and a different picture emerges. One that is both a testament to Buchanan's intellectual powers and at the same time, the utterly chilling story of the ideological origins of the single most powerful and least understood threat to democracy today, the attempt by the billionaire-backed radical right to undo democratic governance. So this is a story about how Buchanan's ideas were later weaponized by Charles Koch and the donor network that he's convened to transform our country. Um, and uh, I'll keep my remarks brief today, but I thought I'd say, uh, start by sharing with you the response of one reader to the book um, that I particularly uh, appreciated. And this man was a Civil War buff. And he told me that he was terrified by what he was reading in the book, but that by the end he became hopeful because he remembered an analogous moment in the Civil War. He compared our situation today in America to that facing the Union Army in 19, I'm sorry, in 1862. At that moment, General Robert E. Lee, who's lately been much in the news uh, as we debate these monuments that commemorate um, the Confederacy, General Lee was going from uh, victory to victory and was just 40 miles outside of Washington, D.C., advancing the Confederacy's bid to uphold slavery in the name of liberty. But at that moment, chance intervened. An Indiana Union Army corporal volunteer named Barton Mitchell found a fat envelope in a campground that had just been vacated by General Lee's forces. And inside that fat envelope were three cigars, but also the battle plan for the invasion of Maryland. <laughs> Realizing what he'd come, across, uh, come upon, the, uh, the uh, uh, Corporal Mitchell passed it up the chain of command to, and it reached General McClellan, who with that, document was able to inflict the first really significant Union defeat on uh, uh, General Lee at the Battle of Antietam, and it proved a turning point for the Union Army in that war. Uh, so I think about this Corporal Barton Mitchell a lot these days, and I really hope that that reader was right, that what I found uh, does turn out to have the capacity to move back uh, this, this program that we're seeing now in an analogous way. Because what the proxy army of Charles Koch left behind and that I stumbled upon in my research in an untended old office at George Mason University, just across the Potomac from Washington, DC, was a lot like General Robert E. Lee's battle plan. And not just in their shared commitment to property supremacy, a cause that I have come to think about as property supremacy because I think that best captures what this is really about. And where journalists, above all the brilliant Jane Mayer, I'm sure many of you have read her pieces in The New Yorker or perhaps the full book, uh, Dark Money, where journalists have done a terrific job following the, uh, uh, the money trail uh, of this uh, Coke and other, other uh, funding to the, the radical right, I happened in that abandoned base camp and in some earlier reading on the ideas that are making this uh, strategy so devastatingly effective. The ideas that are guiding the Koch's operational strategy for transforming our country, in fact, by stealth, and I'll come back to that. Um, and these ideas also alert us to what the real end game of this project is in a way that I don't think you, you can grasp if you don't understand the history that led to it and the ideas themselves. So in short, the real end game of this Koch donor network is in fact enchaining democracy, uh, as my title suggests. And the plan is to bind our political process in such a way as to make our institutions incapable of responding to the popular will, at least where it involves taxation, tax transfers, uh, and spending. And where the democratic side, we could say even small d, democratic, uh, side of our politics over recent decades has been issue-oriented, campaign-focused, uh, and siloed, this Koch-guided right has been power-oriented, has been weaponizing uh, a set of ideas and making alliances with an eye to rigging the rules of the game of politics, as one of my subjects said, across the board. So what we've seen uh, 
particularly dramatically since early uh, 2011, when Scott, Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin, uh, by his own uh, description of what he was doing, said, this is our moment. And he referred, he said, you know, we dropped the bomb when he took away uh, bargaining rights from public sector workers. But what we've been seeing is not just about one issue or one target group or even a bunch of issues added up. And it's far more than partisan, as I think much of our media would suggest. It is actually, I found in my research, an audacious bid to fundamentally change the relationship between the government and the people permanently. It is a plan to change the very soul of our society, to shred the safety net, and then to keep it from being recreated. To grasp why having this plan of action matters, let me quote the head of Koch Industries Government and Public Affairs Operation, a man named Mark Holden, who gloated to an invitation-only summit of billionaire and multimillionaire donors in late 2015. He said, and I'm quoting, we're close to winning. They, he was referring to critics of the Koch donor network, but I think they re refers to the rest of the citizenry just as well, they don't have the real path. They don't have the real path. Uh, I believe that I found that path in my research, uh, partly through happening on it in the same way that Barton Mitchell did, being able to get into these archives that had not been uh, uh, looked at before. And it is a path that leads through control of a growing number of states. There are now 30 states that are dominated by this cause to the point of electoral stranglehold, in the words of the Democracy Alliance. Through those states, what we see is the, the um, elected officials allied with this cause, like your own governor, um, uh, altering the rules of politics as they go in a set of what Koch calls interrelated plays. So those interrelated plays involve things like voter suppression, the most radical and sophisticated gerrymandering we've ever seen in our political history, such that the elected officials are choosing their voters rather than the voters choosing their elected <coughs> officials, the destruction of uh, labor union uh, power, particularly public sector unions, taking particular aim at teachers' unions, privatization of public resources, including education, parks, you know, and, 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 and so much more. Uh, and ultimately, where they're going with this is to build toward a constitutional convention. A constitutional convention to amend our nation's founding document, uh, and this would be the first and only state-convened constitutional convention since 1787. Now, some of you are probably thinking, oh no, <laughs> who is she? <laughs> you know, this is crazy, it's impossible, it must be exaggerated, but bear with me. And think about this. While the eyes of most of our journalists and of most citizens have been focused on Washington for some time now and lately on Donald Trump in particular, a man I've come to think about as the distractor in chief, uh, the scores of organizations and elected officials funded by Charles Koch and the donor network he's convened of now hundreds of, of uh, donors who give $100,000 a year, they have been lining up the authorizations needed for such a convention. And they now have authorizations from 28 of the 34 states needed to call a convention under Article 5 of the Constitution. I believe that the ballooning $1.5 trillion deficit that will come from the tax bill that they uh, planned in, uh, that they passed in December could help them to get the remaining six. Because here's the really scary thing. There are six states in which the GOP controls both houses of the legislature that have not yet authorized such a convention. Idaho, Kentucky, Minnesota, Montana, South Carolina, and Virginia. All six of those could be lined up within the next few years uh, at this rate, particularly with this deficit growing because the first item of business at such a constitutional convention, and the one that polls well, is a balanced budget amendment, something the right has been trying to get through the political process for years and not succeeding because it polls well until people realize it could be the end of Social Security, the end of Medicare, the end of environmental protection, and many other things that they value. 
Uh, okay, so a little background on this. Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution provides two routes to amending the Constitution. One is the one we're all familiar with. It's been done many times. It's brought us some really good things like the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, women's suffrage, the end of the poll tax, all these things that are good, and some stupid ones like prohibition that later got uh, 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 rescinded. It also has this untried route that stipulates that two-thirds of the states can call a convention, a convention that would necessarily be a runaway convention because there's no rules for what happens once it's convened, just how to get people there. And here's an irony. Back in 1787, that state um, uh, convening mechanism was put into the Constitution, argued for by Delegate George Mason of Virginia. Uh, and he won the assent of its fellow, his fellows, so it's in the Constitution. But as coincidence would have it, George Mason University today is the intellectual base camp of the Koch political operation, a story I tell in the book, uh, with its economics department lining up the game plan for these kinds of radical changes, something called the Mercatus Center, advancing these policies to Congress and the states and to con training congressional and judicial staff in uh, how to apply these measures, and it's recently renamed Scalia School of Law, uh, advancing the case for the kind of Gilded Age constitution that the libertarian right would like to see uh, in place. So what kind of a country would we have if these constitutional changes by the right succeeded on top of the other measures we've already seen? Charles Koch would tell you it would be a glorious land of liberty where with enterprise finally freed from restraint, we'd see prosperity on a scale we never saw before. We might even see world peace. It would just be a kind of nirvana. But the scholars he's funded and the sources that I found in my research uh, tell us something else. They tell us that this libertarian utopia would look a lot like America in 1900 a place where workers had no right to collective voice, and as a result, we had rolling civil wars between capital and labor, where we had a Supreme Court that threw out all the reform proposals that were coming up from the states and from the cities, trying to make the system fairer, saying that they were unconstitutional, a place where corporations were all but free of democratic accountability, whether it was for discrimination or pollution or consumer protection, and needless to say, a place with no social insurance. So no social security or Medicare. People would be individually responsible for all of their needs in this world. Now, uh, not even re the Republican voters who are sticking with Donald Trump would want to live in this world if they understood that that is what these donors have in mind. Uh, so how could the Koch-led right carry out this kind of radical transformation in a democracy? That's where my research brings something particularly new to the table. The operational strategy that Koch and his team have devised to surmount this obstacle of a functioning democracy that would block these measures if people understood it, I discovered in my research at that abandoned uh, camp at uh, George Mason, depends upon stealth. It proceeds through a series of what Koch has called interrelated plays that would make liberty self-reinforcing. These are incremental changes that build on one another in a cumulative manner so that this cause never actually has to inform the people of what the true end game is, or even be honest about the purpose of the moves, uh, each of these moves, as the overall goal moves, uh, project moves closer to, the, to its goal. Why stealth? Because, and I think this is the single most important finding of my book, because uh, Koch and his field generals know from repeated historical experience, going back to the candidacy of uh, Barry Goldwater in 1964, going back to Ronald Reagan's uh, first budget and his backing up from that uh, in 1981, George W. Bush, many, many experiences have taught them that this the real vision that they're after will never attract popular support and that po uh, politicians will back up from the brink, seeing that voters don't want this. And uh, as Koch himself said, when he got serious about moving this cause along in the late 1990s, he said, since we are greatly outnumbered, the failure to use our superior technology ensures failure. 
This is a very brilliant man with three engineering degrees from MIT. When he talks about technology, he's talking about ideas, the kind of ideas that have enabled him again and again to best the competition in building up Coke Industries into a multinational corporation, one of the largest privately held corporations in the world. And he's also talking about besting the political competition to his view of how the country should be organized. So what is this superior technology that Koch was calling on uh, his team members to apply? He found these ideas in the school of thought developed by a Virginia-based, little-known Nobel Prize winner named James McGill, McGill Buchanan, the only US Southerner to win that prize. The man who, as I described earlier, set up a center in Charlottesville, Virginia, at the peak of massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education to develop a new line of thinkers. And. Uh, Buchanan began, at that point, crafting a new set of ideas to counter the New Deal and the emerging civil rights movement at their very source, what was then the widespread belief in government and trust that it could remedy market failure for the common good. And it's interesting to think about the numbers there. In, uh, I think it was 1952 or something, 91 percent of the American people trusted our elected officials to do what was right most of the time, right, to tr and, and believe that they were trying to advance the public good and the common interest. Now it's 13 percent. So I'm not saying that James Buchanan is solely re you know, responsible for that. There are many other things that have intervened, but this set of ideas have self-consciously gone after the, that idea of, uh, that, that public actors are trying to serve the public good and, and been doing it for, for some time. And in fact, his strategy took dead aim at that trust. He tried to use his economics training to make the case that government could not do what it promised because politicians were not really trying to advance the common good. They were just trying to get themselves elected or re-elected using other people's money. And his school of thought said the same thing is true of all other public actors. If it's union officials, they don't really care about the workers. They're just trying to expand their dues base. People in the EPA, they don't really care about the environment. They just want to get more federal money to expand their fiefdoms, and on and on and on. Uh, public health workers, they don't really care about the public health. They just want to, to, to get their jobs. It is such a corrosive set of ideas, and it is quite widespread uh, at this point. Now, one of Buchanan's greatest gifts to the right, in an overarching one, was this advice. If you don't like the outcome of public policy over a long term, and you have to realize that the libertarian cause, at least as represented by Charles Koch, does not like the whole 20th century. Right? I mean, seriously, beginning with the Progressive Era and the Pure Food and Drug Act and antitrust administration, moving on to social insurance of the New Deal era, going on to the anti-discrimination legislation of the Civil Rights era, to the environmental protection regulations later on. They do not like the 20th century. So Buchanan said, if you don't like the outcomes of the political process over a long period of time, stop thinking about who rules and think about the rules. What he was getting at was stop thinking about the particular individuals who will be elected or even the political parties and think about how you might change the rules. He believed that the existing rules produce tax and spend behavior no matter who was in office and that that had to be changed. His next gift was the outline of a new economic constitution, as he called it a new set of inviolable rules that would end the transfer of wealth via taxes from the unwilling but compelled people he referred to as productive contributors, those the right now refers to as makers and calls the rest of us takers. Uh, uh, and he actually used the word parasites for the rest of us, for people who look to government for, you know, whether it's senior citizens for a drug benefit or environmentalists for some other kind of policy or folks who need anti-discrimination laws, et cetera. Anyway, here's the thing. This is not abstract. This is not um, uh, pie in the sky. It has actually already been tried. In 1980, the government of Augusto Pinochet, uh, the, the military junta of Augusto Pinochet in Chile, invited Buchanan to come to Chile and advise on a constitution that would do just this. It is called the Constitution of Liberty. 
And even after the dictators left power, that constitution has made it so that it's nearly impossible for Chileans to reverse what the dictatorship did in their country. In particular, the things that most upset the people of Chile, which were the privatization of Social Security, their Social Security system, so that their savings went to banker, you know, to the financial sector, and theirs behaved about as well as ours did when it was deregulated, uh, and also the privatization of education that has made Chile and uh, high, um, college education among the most expensive in the developed world. So. Just a few years ago, uh, Michelle Bachelet, a, a candidate who was elected by two-thirds of the Chilean people on a wide-ranging reform program to address these things, she was elected to office and she realized that she could not act. She could not deliver on those promises because of this so-called constitution of liberty and the way it prevented her from um, uh, responding to the will of that supermajority of the Chilean people. So here's where this begins to connect to our situation, because it's not a detour. Charles Koch noticed this success. He had actually known Buchanan since at least about 1970, and in 1981 he moved the Cato Institute to Washington to make it more policy relevant, to get more active in shifting the country, uh, and its top priority was Social Security privatization. And so he brought Buchanan, they brought Buchanan in for this in 1983 to give advice on how to achieve this. Uh, you, I'll, I'll make a, I don't want to do a total spoiler alert, but there's a, a discussion of it in the book, but I will just say not by honest means, right? Buchanan understood that Social Security was incredibly popular with every constituency, and he went through all the demographics. There's a solid phalanx in support of this program because it's good and it works. So he said, you don't want to pros, uh, go, take it on frontally. Instead, what you need to do is spread the idea that it's not viable so that people won't trust it, they won't believe it's going to be there for them, and you can weaken support in that way. And then he also advised on a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, approach to uh, kind of divide and conquer in a very sophisticated way. And I won't get into the details of that right now, but I can if you'd like me to, and they're, they're spelled out more in the book. So these discussions go on over the years, and over the years, uh, Koch himself becomes more desperate. He's getting older, he's 80, I believe now, uh, and uh, seeing all these changes in the country that were disturbing to him. And by 1997, he concluded that Buchanan's school of thought gave him, in his words, the technology needed to achieve this radical transformation one that would go behind the backs of the people, not telling us frontally what they're really about, but instead changing the rules of the game systematically to produce different outcomes. And so in that year, 1997, he gave his first $10 million to Buchanan Center at George Mason University, again, this public university just across the Potomac from Washington. Um, and he made clear with that speech that he expected bold results from his investment. And to give you a sense of just how ambitious and audacious his vision was, I will quote him in the speech he, said, he gave when he uh, uh, delivered this gift. I want to unleash the kind of force that propelled Columbus to his discoveries, he said. He has also compared himself to Martin Luther. So this is a very messianic vision of his role in leading a transformation. We have all felt the force of that investment in the years since. And by now, by the, now, by the way, he's, he's George Mason's biggest donor. Uh, but we have felt it in this systematic rules change, both in the states and nationally, in this plan that has weaponized Buchanan's school of thought and brought us to the current crisis. We see the force of that in the transformation of the Republican Party. And I'm sure many of you, you know, some of you perhaps are Republican voters, some of you have neighbors and friends and family members who are Republican voters who are going, what happened to my party, <laughs> right? That it has become almost unrecognizable, even from the kind of conservative state that it was in in previous years, but in the most obvious case on that health care legislation uh, that we saw, you know, those three bills we saw last year, none of those polled above 18%, right? Why would a party try to push through legislation that didn't have majority support in any state in the country, that never polled above 18%, the reason is because the Koch donor network changed the incentives so that those elected officials are now accountable to the right-wing donors rather than Republican voters. Uh, and they actually brag about that. They call it their secret sauce, 
the, the accountability play that makes the elected officials respond to those arch right donors rather than their own voters. So we see that uh, nationally. We also see that in the states. We saw it in, Scott, in Wisconsin in 2011 with Scott Walker um, when he set off all the mayhem there to try to uh, undermine labor unions in that state. Uh, arguably, though, the, this radical rewriting of the rules has gone farthest in my own uh, uh, adopted state of North Carolina. Since the 2010 midterms brought this radicalized Republican Party to power, uh, we have seen a spate of radical changes that go on to at least five pages. I won't run through all of them, but I'll just point to some because I think they might be familiar to you and I think they indicate this radical rewriting of the rules. One of them is of course the most, and I mentioned this before, but the most sophisticated gerrymander we've ever seen in our political history, right? Another is um, sharp attacks on public education at all levels and radical cuts in funding for it while shifting off tax revenues to private schools that one shock judge found are under no legal obligation to teach students anything. Uh, they uh, uh, rescinded a racial justice act that was designed to ensure fairness in, in um, uh, policing and in the criminal justice system. They uh, have attacked uh, labor unions in general and teachers unions in particular. They have rolled back measures to protect the environment and reduce global warming and on and on and on. And within those uh, changes, they have also uh, worked with breakneck speed and secrecy frequently, um, not even stopping for traditional things like hearings before passing significant legislation. So it's been quite dramatic. And then they capped off all of this by passing something called the Monster Voter Suppression Bill of 2013 that in some 15 different ways tried to suppress the votes of people who would challenge uh, this agenda. They are now actually trying to undermine our independent judiciary in North Carolina, something that's not getting nearly the attention it should because again, all eyes are focused on uh, President Trump's latest tweets and so forth. Um, so uh, in Washington too, we've seen this steady escalation of tactical warfare by this Republican right in Congress that thinks that compromise is a dirty word, right? So they have pushed um, to brinkmanship by the Koch donor network. They have tried to repeal Obamacare. They have um, uh, done radical um, uh, uh, evisceration of environmental legislation and so forth, refused the Affordable Care Act, immigration reform, and, and on and on. Uh, and then, having gotten every Republican front runner to carry that Koch donor agenda in the 2016 uh, primaries, they created a field so toxic that Donald Trump managed to win. And now, lo and behold, the Koch wish list is being implemented with epic speed by this Trump administration on everything from labor rights and the environment to education to the judiciary to health care uh, and, and taxation. And uh, Donald Trump, I mean, sorry, uh, Charles Koch actually recently boasted at the, the uh, latest donor summit that they had gotten, he said, I've gotten more accomplished, or what do you say, how do you say, we've gotten more accomplished in the last five years than I was able to accomplish in the preceding 50. So there's this sense of gloating at how uh, quickly this is moving through. So I know this is a lot to absorb. Um, uh, <laughs> and I'm sorry for that. Um, I know it's probably deeply unsettling. I can tell you that it was unsettling for me also doing uh, this research. Uh, but I want to uh, turn to setting up a discussion by putting out the kind of all important question that we're facing. And that is, if we have this Coke battle plan, if we now know where it comes from, know the ideas that it's coming from, that deep history going back to Virginia uh, in the age of massive resistance. If we know how altering the rules is what has made it so successful over the last decade, and if we know why the ultimate end game is changing the Constitution, then what we need to discuss, I think, are the implications for good people such as yourselves who I don't think want to see this agenda go through. I think we can all look at this agenda, hear about this agenda, and realize that it's probably not a kind of world that we would want to live in, and probably not the kind of world that we would want to bequeath to our children and grandchildren and future generations. So the question then becomes, 
how can we address this? So I will stop the here and then uh, take your, your questions on this um, and comments. What I'm seeing is that people are finding uh, this kind of revelation to be really helpful in orienting them to what we're dealing with. So another um, favorite analogy if I have now for the book came from a public health nurse who said, you know, it's like in my line of work, she said, you have to get the diagnosis right before you can determine the correct treatment plan. So I think once we know that this plan that's being you know, implemented by the other side comes from people who are very determined, who have been working on this for decades, who have been playing a very sophisticated long game, very strategic, uh, who are working on multiple fronts. That, I think, also informs us about you know, what we should be thinking about. And I think, actually, there's ultimately much more strength on the side of the pro-democratic forces. Um, I think the single most important finding of my book is that these architects of this cause chose the strategy they did because they understood they'd never have a majority if they actually told people what they really stand for and what they're really trying to achieve. So I think the crucial thing at this point is to alert as many people as possible to this strategy and for people who are concerned to then think about how they can be part of the solution. Uh, and I think different people will work in different ways depending on their own you know, um, personal networks, their contacts, their strengths, their passions, their skills. But I think if we can all think about this is like our democracy is in a real emergency right now. And what's going to happen over the next few years is going to be decisive for a very, very long time. If we're thinking in those terms, then I think we can plug in in the ways that make most sense for us, but doing so with an eye to the larger uh, larger situation. And I see people around the country doing that, so I am really encouraged by that. Uh, one can think about working in kind of concentric circles with the people who are closest to, you know, who maybe share your views but aren't active, getting them active, and you begin to create those ripples that then change the public conversation. Because I think some of those folks uh, who put these folks in office, it might be a while before they see the light. I think that's, this is an international project and it has been since 1947, there was a group um, created to promote this kind of free market fundamentalism by some of the Austrian economists that Charles Koch favors, Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, Milton Friedman was there, Buchanan joined this group in 1957. So that was Europe and the US then, it's now a transnational group and their most recent uh, membership roles, rosters are up in part because uh, environmentalists have put them there because globally uh, these groups, uh, and there's also something called the Atlas Network that has 450 groups operating in 90 countries uh, and one of the things that they are doing is pushing climate science denial. They are deadly determined to stop any action on what's happening to our planet. So they are key sources uh, pushing out this kind of smog about the climate. Uh, so, so that would be one element of the international agenda, right? They're pushing a kind of agenda that I've described for the domestic politics of each country um, that would do these kinds of things. But also they are determined to stop the kind of international cooperation that was developing around the Paris Climate Accords and other such efforts. So there's actually researchers in Britain who have shared information with me about the role of the Koch network in Brexit, right? So they're actually, it seems like, and the research is still to come in on some of this, but stimulating this kind of right-wing populism because it gets people to turn against international cooperation by governments to address this threat uh, and others. Uh, so uh, it is, to know about this, to understand the foreign policy of this network, I think we need to go back to the, um, the foreign policy of the old right between the, the wars, because that's the kind of um, foreign policy that Charles Koch believes in, I think, this old libertarian right agenda, which was against any kind of multilateral institutions, multilateral cooperation. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a frightening vision, I think, yeah. It's a really important question though, yes. The second thing I'd say is we're learning more and more now. There's some really, really good researchers who are out here on the task and I've read from two European historians, one of whom recently had a, a piece um, showing that this notion that there's these guys on the one hand and these right-wing populists on the other, 
uh-uh, there's too many connections. So some of the, the right-wing uh, figures, particularly this person was writing about Germany and Austria, they are connected with the Hayek institutes that are connected with this Atlas network. And, and I think the, the way that we can understand that is this cause is, it has social Darwinism built into it. If you remember that whole language, that way of thinking in the late 19th century that basically said, you know, that, um, if you're already wealthy, you know, it's yours, it's wonderful, you earned it, you know, you should be celebrated as an entrepreneur or whatever. But the people who don't have anything, it's like um, Dickens, right? Like, uh, um, they are contemptuous toward them, right? And contemptuous toward anybody who's had a hard time, who isn't, make, who isn't wealthy, who needs some kind of assistance, uh, and very condemnatory towards them. So I've actually started to think about their ideas as being like economic eugenics. You know, that, that kind of attitude toward other people uh, and wanting uh, the rest of us to think like that too. So it's not surprising that they have people who regularly slide off from libertarianism to these far right, you know, alt right as they're called now groups. Uh, yeah, so Charles Koch has been investing in trying to promote uh, a different kind of judiciary at least since 1970. And there was a colleague of James Buchanan's at George Mason. Buchanan got him hired as the dean of the law school, a guy named Henry Manny, who ran what people jokingly called Henry Manny Camp in the summers, where they would provide, with Coke money and others, luxury accommodations to bring in legal scholars and federal judges to get exposed to this law and economics curriculum, as they call it. And by 1997, when Koch made that big gift to George Mason, Henry Manny's programs had trained two-fifths of all sitting federal judges in the US. 40% had been treated to this Koch-backed curriculum. So it's big. Now, since then, Obama did get to name, you know, things have happened since then. It's not like those same people are there. But what's really appalling about our current situation is that Donald Trump, in the short term he's been in office, has made more federal judicial appointments than anyone, I, I think, since they've been you know, keeping records on this. And he was able to do that because of the way this radicalized Republican Party denied President Obama the rights of a sitting president, right? So they held back that Supreme Court uh, um, uh, seat. And you know, I think Neil Gorsuch is illegitimate because of that, right? Because that seat was effectively stolen from a sitting president. And so I think that the decision, you know, I think we have to do what people of the turn of the century did, which is to start, you know, questioning the legitimacy of decisions that are coming down from judges who were appointed through a process that is essentially uh, abusing, uh, um, abusing the people and the rules of our democracy. So uh, they are having a big impact on the judiciary. And, and um, you can look at the Koch, uh, the law, the Koch Law School, the Scalia School of Law that George Mason is pushing out a lot of this stuff. So they actually train Scott Pruitt, who, you know, um, Trump's head of the EPA, comes out of this network from Oklahoma. But he, um, there, there were folks at George Mason's law school who organized this summit. They called it the Summit on fossil fuels and federalism. Uh, I forget the exact year, but during Obama's presidency. So they brought these Republican attorneys general together to essentially do what the southern states did against the federal government in the 50s and 60s, right? To defy federal authority, claiming states' rights. And Pruitt was central to that and is now doing that um, uh, at the EPA. So, the, the, so that's another arena where I'd love to see this message get out more, is to uh, work Working attorneys, particularly people who are engaged in public issue, pu public interest law or constitutional work, and law schools, because I don't think um, legal folks in America know enough about what's happening here and how serious it is. With their donors, they make them check their phones so that nobody, uh huh, so that nobody can record what goes on in these summits. They very carefully police it. Even like you know, uh, uh, you know camping on the front lawn of their mansion or something. You know, oh. Yeah. Really yeah, yeah, in their face yeah. About you know our dislike of what they're talking about and doing. Okay. Actually, you you just made me think of a really great way that might be easier to do. Um, I didn't get into it here. Uh, I talked about the George Mason campus and how they have turned that into a base camp for their political project, using their political connections as well. Um, but. Since that was established, there 
money to campuses has surged. Uh, so from 2005 to 2015, that list looks like this. They're up to over 350 campuses that they're investing in in a big way. They are provoking these fake free speech controversies by bringing in these you know, awful speakers they know the students will react to. Then they go to the donors and the trustees and say, look, you have to have one of our centers here. I mean, it's so calculated. So one great way to deal with that is to um, check out the website of a wonderful group of young people called Uncoke My Campus, <laughs> who are doing state-of-the-art research about them and exposing them, and then find out, and they also, uh, on that website, have a list of the schools, at least up to 2015, that have accepted these Coke uh, monies and centers. See if your campus has one, you know, where, where your, your um, alma mater, and start speaking up about it. There was just an article uh, this past week that Wellesley, college had one of these centers and somebody got word to the alumni who include Diane Ravitch, the school reformer. The alumni said, what? <laughs> what? And they shut it down. Uh, so so that's, I think that would be a way to, to convey the message and to not let them do that kind of, you know, greenwashing of, of their project. So that's probably an easier one to get to. You know, it's an interesting thing uh, because uh, we also find this cause celebrating many of their thinkers celebrating the Confederacy, right? They like the Confederate Constitution and so forth. And I mean, that was a rebellion against America, right? Um, so I, I hear you. Uh, and I actually use the phrase in uh, the introduction to my book of, I, I ask whether we should be thinking of this as a fifth column, right? You know, that notion that comes from the Spanish Civil War. Because these guys, I mean, this billionaire grouping that Charles Koch has um, pulled together, they're so hostile to our democracy as it exists and to fellow citizens who they just see, I mean, it. it it, and it is just like John's, and I have a prologue on John C. Calhoun, the pro-slavery, you know, the guy whose ideas informed so much of the Confederacy. And he, here was a slaveholder whose wealth came from owning other men, women, and children. That's how he got his wealth. Well, he is the original source of this makers and takers framework, Calhoun. You know, so he was styling himself a maker when he had unfree labor that made him wealthy, and he feared, the takers of his day that he feared, were the small farmers from the upcountry, right, who wanted government to create public schools for the kids, to create roads so they could get their goods to market. He saw that as exploiting taxpayers like himself. So this is the kind of tradition they come from. So, so I, I hear you. But I will say, like some people have said, so is this a conspiracy? And the truth is, a conspiracy involves illegality. And these guys have the best, you know, so much money to hire the best legal talent to stay on the bright side of the law, with possible exception of nonprofit law. I think that's where we should be watching them violating IRS uh, statutes. But um, so, so they're actually operating within the law and kind of gloating. Uh, about that. So it's not a conspiracy in that sense, but it is concerted action on a breathtaking scale from people who are deeply hostile to the model of government that citizens have built up in this country over more than a century now. So it's really quite something. Yes. Yeah, well, there are some amazing journalists out there who are so talented and so committed and have provided so much illumination. I think of Jane Mayer in this. She was the first person to alert us to uh, the Koch Network. And there are other people on this beat now. Um, a young man named Alex Koch has a great piece in The Most Recent Nation showing how Charles Koch has been funding neo-Confederate thinkers <laughs> and white supremacist scholars and actually bringing that into our prison. So there's individuals who are doing great work. Collectively, I think our media is really failing us at this point in the sense that um, I think they're overcorrecting from being too soft on Trump, you know, before. So now it's like every day's news is Trump, 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 you know, and like seven out of 10 articles sometimes are about this man as an individual and what he's doing. And as a result, they are not, and they're, and they're treating, they also, I Way I like they have attention deficit disorder, right? So most of them think the Coke story that's over, right? That was 2015 because now we have Donald Trump all the time, and so they're not even asking how these go together, even though this Coke agenda is being pushed through, ra you know, rapidly under Trump. So, um, so I think that um, 
some of them are part of the problem, um, but I think they could also be productively challenged. You know, for people to even you know call their their news uh, sources or write to them to say what you think they're missing, you know, what they should be reporting on, and also to teach them to ask follow-up questions because our press is not good about that. So, for example, on the social security question, you know, the um, Koch people and the the radical Republicans like. They, they hire pollsters, right? They know how to package stuff. So they'll talk about social security reform. Like, we want to make it more stable. No, they don't. <laughs> they want to undermine it. But our media doesn't know enough to say, our, our journalists and, and so forth don't know enough to ask the follow-up question and say, oh, really, you want to reform it. So you support the original principle of social insurance on which these programs were founded. They can't say yes to that. They don't. They think we should have individual accounts. So I think the more the people know to push the journalists and to challenge the elected officials, the better off we'll be. I also think there is a record number of Republicans quitting the House now. And the journalists are just letting them go into that good night. Like, I don't think we should, do, we should say, why are you leaving? What did you see? What has happened to your party? Tell the rest of us what's going on in your caucus. We need to ask those things. Yes? If a state legislature has indicated support for a new constitutional convention, is there legal precedent to suggest that they can revoke that? Yes, in fact, Common Cause, if you're interested in the Constitutional Convention question, Common Cause has done the best work on this, and their website has lots of information. And they have actually gotten four states to rescind their authorizations. Uh, unfortunately, I was recently talking to a member of their legal staff, and he was saying that they can't, they can't see getting any more state governments to take them back because now they're the state governments that are trying to, uh, to put them through. But they did get four states to, to rescind, including New Mexico, but then Scott Walker's Wisconsin just came in as authorizing. But I will say this, I will say this, that um, uh, so you need uh, two thirds of the states to, con to call such a convention, to, to constitute it, and then uh, three quarters of the states to ratify it. Um, so that, you know, it's not like it just whatever they do will, will go into effect. There's a, there's a chance to respond to this. But the tricky part of that is because such a constitution would be a runaway uh, convention, it's not clear what the ratification process would be. You know what I mean? That they could set a ratification process that involves the states that they control or these other things. But I do think the more that people know about it, the more people are talking about it, uh, the less likely they are to be able to put it through. Yes, sir. Is there a blueprint for uh, an alternative constitution? What components are they seeking to? Uh, oh, yeah, good question. And, yeah. And those that they wish to put forward. Yeah. So there are actually, uh, they have, t it's, not exactly clear what their ultimate plan is. Some say they would only do the, ba the balanced budget amendment, um, but, uh, but again, it's a runaway convention, so it probably wouldn't stop there. So uh, there's a, a legal scholar, activist, um, and talk show host named Mark Levin, who wrote a book called The Liberty Amendments. If you just look up, if you Google Liberty Amendments, you'll see 10 of them, and they include such things along with the balanced budget amendment as, just to give you a sense of the radicalism, revoking the 17th amendment, the amendment that brought us the direct election of US senators. This came out of the progressive era, right? As people saw that the state governments were actually the branch of government most likely to be captive to the you know robber baron corporations, as they were called at the time, uh, they a reform was made, a constitutional amendment, so that we would directly elect our senators. Well, they want to go back to having the state governments choose the US senators. So that's, that's kind of how radical it is. And a deep need, which again, many people who are um, you know, active today are realizing, a deep need to change the public conversation, right? To restore discussion about what is the common good? How do we uh, derive, you know, how do we, how do we identify that? Why do we pay taxes? <laughs> Where do they go? How are they important? I think, you know, we, we, this is a moment, I believe, like the 1860s and like the 1930s. Not as dramatic, but very like those in that we have a very strongly anti-democratic current in our history and in our political culture that feels very legitimate and that came up with the Confederacy 
Morrissey. It came up with the property supremacists in the New Deal. Both times, the larger portion of the population were the pro-democracy forces, but the only way they defeated the anti-democratic forces was by renewing democracy, right? By enfranchising the freedmen in Reconstruction, uh, you know, and having the radical Reconstruction governments, the Freedmen's Bureau, and so forth. And then in the New Deal, by creating the New Deal itself, by empowering workers and consumers, and we got periods of pretty dramatic public hope and change and lots of good things happening in those. I think that's what's got to happen again. Sir. So I was thinking about uh, this whole effort nationwide uh -huh. to have a balanced budget amendment. Uh -huh. But it's come up in Maine the last couple of times. There have been progressives who said, this is great. It would be our opportunity to get Citizens United dealt with as part of that balanced budget yeah. convention, and we're all for it. Has that come up in other states? Yes. Yeah, and it's really a challenge. In fact, I spoke to some of the folks from Common Cause who said that when they were trying to rescind the authorization, getting the um, folks in New Mexico to rescind that authorization, they were up against a group, uh, um, I think they called themselves the Young Turks or something, but who were trying to defeat them and saying that, no, we want to have a constitutional convention so we can take up Citizens United. And you know, you just go, wake up. <laughs> You know, because this right right now is so organized and marching in step and coordinating at every step of the game through all these different domains and, and organizations, and we just don't have that on the progressive side. We don't even have the channels of communication built well yet. So any convention at this point would be totally on the terms of this group and I think would do a lot of damage. So I think, yeah, I, I'm glad that you raised that because it is a real issue uh, out there, not just in this state, but in others. Uh, but yeah, I think it would be a mistake, yes. I think so often on the progressive side of politics, um, we get these either or formulations, you know, like it's either bottom up in mass movements or it's top down. I have to tell you as a scholar of social movements, they almost never succeed unless you have both. You need the mass struggle, the mass organization, the disruption to get people focused on the issue. But if you don't have any allies on the inside, you're not going to make any lasting reform or anything change. So I, I would like to live in the both and <laughs> world. Um, yeah, no, it's a real mess. And that's why I think going back, I think taxes are in some ways the most important issue of our time, that we have to start a different kind of conversation about taxes. We're here in a um, friends meeting house. And I know the American Friends Service Committee has been so important over the years you know, on issues of war and empire. So I think we're going to have to have a conversation about where are all these monies going, right? The most recent Trump budget, there's so much money going to a military that's already engorged um, and nothing going to these other needs. But I think there are so many things to be encouraged now with the teachers in West Virginia, 55 counties, totally solid. Um, and by the way, has anybody ever seen the movie Matewan? John Sayles? So my class had seen that when we, we looked at the socialist movement. It's a wonderful movie. Mate Juan. It's about the mine wars in West Virginia in, um, uh, at the turn of the century. And anyway, it was so exciting for my students to have watched that movie that's centered in Mingo County and then find out that Mingo County was a stronghold of the, um, of the teachers' movement. Uh, I'm going to try to get people who haven't. But, but interesting, as long as you've introduced the Bible too, let me, let me mention that there is a passage in the book, that, that uh, part in the book that talks about something that Buchanan did, uh, a piece that he wrote in I think 1973 or 75. It was called The Samaritan's Dilemma. And he actually went back to the parable of the Good Samaritan and turned it on its head to say that essentially Jesus was wrong about the modern world, that you couldn't have those kind of compassionate ethics in our modern world, and that if you helped someone who seemed to be suffering and seemed to be a victim, that person would come around and exploit you as a parasite. I mean, it's really a stunning thing to behold. So I think also for people of faith, uh, that is really interesting to know because this libertarian cause, they do have an ethical system, but it is absolutely at odds with the best of every major religious tradition in the world. And I think the more people know that, the more we'll be equipped to deal with it. Yes, I think probably you want to wrap up the form, but we can talk one-on-one -on -one back at the table there. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The wonderful community you have here.